you very much for the friendly uh, invitation again, the friendly introduction. I can repeat only what I said last time. I'm very happy to be here. I'm having a wonderful time. I'm enjoying myself. I learn a lot. So, let me now discuss the nine dimensions. That's the program now for the next steps. I'm going through these different uh, dimensions, descriptions, explanations, and so on and so forth, all nine of them. And I give you examples of the higher degree of systematicity of the sciences in the wide sense, you know, including humanities, please follow it. Um, uh, and I'm going to give these examples and well, uh, make a few remarks. Then. So let me start with something which is undoubtedly a very, very systematic endeavor, and no one really can doubt that, and nobody really doubts it, mathematics. The classical formal sciences, the classical mathematics, there are branches of mathematics that uh, proceed somewhat differently. So if you take the classic formal sciences, uh, of course, they describe their domain of inquiry by an axiomatic description. It's an axiomatic description. What is an axiomatic description? The axioms must be logically independent, simple, and as complete as possible regarding logical consequences and consistent. These are the four postulates on axioms, and I've been quite careful here, complete as possible. I know Gödel existed. So that is what uh, mathematicians think of a really systematic description. It's an axiomatic description, and the axioms have to have these properties. Now, if you go to the empirical sciences, there is one uh, device used in many, many, many different fields, including, you see immediately across the board, namely it is classification, taxonomy, and nomenclature. The classification is uh, just putting different objects into boxes, and taxonomy is having a hierarchy of boxes. And nomenclature is having names for these different boxes, right? So if you look, for instance, the classification of mathematical objects is very important. If you take, for instance, theory of groups, the classification of groups is very important. Biological species, for instance, of course they have to be classified. There are something like a 10 million biological species. Then minerals have to be classified. Chemical elements, compounds. If you look at the number of uh, chemical compounds that, that are known today, including organic chemistry, we are dealing with something, again, 10 million. It's huge amounts. And you need, of course, also a, a very sophisticated nomenclature. Otherwise, you get lost immediately. And you see how systematic the sciences have to be there in order to really conquer this variety of things. But also languages, for instance, have to be classified Forms of government are classified, very interesting for many states, right? What sort of government do we have? Is it a democracy or is it something else? And you have to classify different forms. Structures of societies as well, literary genres, etc., etc. What I'm trying to show here is that the sciences have, in order to describe their area, what they're talking about, the device of classification and taxonomy in order to bring order, and that means systematicity, to the descriptions. And of course, if you, if you think of that, I mean, just look at chemistry, 10 million compounds, I mean, this can't be compared to anything systematic we do in everyday knowledge. You know, we talk about a few things in everyday knowledge in comparison. There are about 10 million things we have really to classify and conquer. Now, Biological species, for instance, if you go there to the literature, it used to be just a level of two things, you know, genus and species. And if you look at the modern classification, it's not even uh, unitary or unique. We have between 26 and 31 levels, depending on the system you're using. So you start with something below here, something very specific, and then you can go up 20, 26 or 31 levels. It's also very interesting if you look at languages. This is the last count, 6,912 languages in 108 families, and it has five levels. You can find all that in the internet, there where I found it, you know, I didn't invent that, that's real. So, uh, by the way, we are um, uh, finding uh, one new language per week, roughly, the linguists. They find one language per week. I compared, this is the, the number from 2005, and in 2000. In the year 2000, it was 250 less, so it's one language per week on average. So the linguists are quite active in discovering new languages, uh, even if it's not physics. 
but uh, they have to make progress. Then, for instance, something interesting in geography, which most of you think it's very boring. It's, uh, well, it's at least challenging. There is a geographic names information system, GNYS, and that lists two million physical and cultural geographic features in the United States. Two million things. And of course, you have to be very careful how to name them. So you really need nomenclature to do that. And you, you've got to bring order into it, and the scientists do it. And that's my message here. Scientific descriptions are extremely systematic and much more systematic than anything else we know in everyday knowledge or we know in the knowledge of other cultures, for that matter. So let us continue. Now, here's something that the physicists, again, will like very much, and I like very much as well. The successful quantification of descriptive statements adds systematicity to a very, very strong degree because it makes more statements possible with higher accuracy and more order. Just take the matter of temperature. If you speak with normal everyday language about temperature, about our outside temperature, then you will say, oh, today it's very hot, or today it's cool, or it's moderate, or it's extremely hot, or it's freezing cold. And you may come up, I guess in Chinese it won't be very different, with perhaps 15 or 20 or 30 different expressions, which are not very well defined. Their order is not very well defined. Now spend 100 Taiwan dollars on a, on, a temper, on a thermometer. I think it should be something like that, right? 100 Taiwanese dollars, and you get a thermometer. And then you describe in tenth of degrees the temperature. Say from minus 20, which happens not to be the case here, say from minus 10 to plus 40 in this country. And you have 500 different statements, right, in precise order. 500 precise statements just to describe the temperature. And that is, of course, the fruit of quantification. So you can describe much more, much more carefully, much more uh, with much higher accuracy, many more statements, and with complete order. And that is, of course, a form of systematicity. You see immediately it's not axiomatic. It's not the same as putting something into axioms. It's a different form of systematicity, but it's quite clear. It is a form of systematicity. It's a systematic description, in that case, of temperature. And you see immediately that our everyday language, our qualitative everyday uh, language is, of course, by far worse than the quantitative language that is used here and which is a successful case in the case of temperature. But believe me one thing, I know exactly why I wrote exact, uh, successful here, because there are also unsuccessful ways of quantifying, and you find many things in the social sciences where people quantify, and if you look then what they quantify and whether that really brings this increase of systematicity, it's sometimes a miserable failure. Sometimes it works. I mean, intelligence, for instance, the quantification of intelligence works to some degree. You know, some people say it's not so good, but I don't know what the assessment centers in this country do when they hire someone for, for a, managing, a management position, whether they have an IQ test as well or not. I don't know. In many countries, they do have an IQ test. Graphology is now out. I learned 30 years ago in Europe, some centers used graphology, right? Uh, I don't know whether, whether that exists in the Chinese tradition because it's so different that the... Uh, I have no idea. But at any rate, in, in, in Europe this is out. Um, but uh, IQ may be used and that's a quantification and it's in doubt whether it's a very good quantification or it's not a very good quantification. At any rate, what I'm saying is when it's successful, of course it's a supreme instrument. A supreme instrument for systematicity in the descriptions. And we'll see another aspect of quantification that adds systematicity, and the physicists are therefore quite right to stress the value of uh, quantification. They shouldn't overstress it, but the stress on it is very important and right. Okay. Now, here's something else, especially physicists use, but also social sciences. When you have empirical generalizations, phenomenological laws, and empirical regularities, by which you describe classes of phenomena, right? If you describe an ideal gas, you don't have to describe every ideal gas separately, but you simply write down the equation, and then you have a generalized description, 
in the form of a phenomenological law, and that phenomenological law is, of course, much more systematic than its individual descriptions, and therefore you add systematicity by descriptions, by phenomenological laws, and also empirical regularities. Now, in the social sciences, there are very few good empirical regularities. There is one candidate that's extremely interesting, and that's the candidate that says, Democracies are never at war against each other. Democracies are never at war against each other. That seems to be a regularity, an empirical regularity in the political sciences. So that's an interesting one. If that is true, then of course uh, it, you can describe the state of all democracies among each other. They're certainly not at war. Okay. Now, what an, an analysis of the um, empirical general relations uh, yells is that in order to have empirical generalizations, uh, you must have adequate classifications. If you have wrong classifications, you will never get, for the wrongly classified items, you never get empirical generalizations. So they test, in a sense, the classification. A good classification leads to empirical regularities. So it seems to be a good contrast to come back here to the uh, uh, social sciences, political science. It seems to be a good contrast to, be, to distinguish between democratic countries and non-democratic countries because you get a law or an empirical regularity for the democratic countries. So it makes sense to make that difference. If you make a difference uh, that is irrelevant concerning regularities, then you say, so what, what, what difference does it make? So that's a test then uh, how your, your increase of systematicity by classification um, is useful in order to articulate empirical generalizations. Also, that's what I said, you, unif you unify singular descriptions. Now, something similar than the classification is periodization. That is what all historical disciplines do and many theories of development. So if you look, whatever it is, world history is classified ancient times, medieval times, modern times, if you look at Egyptian history, it's classified, uh, it, it's uh, periodized. If you look at the history of Taiwan, certainly 1895 is an important date, 1945 is an important date, and others as well. And you, you have for the last 100 years already two big phases, 115 years, two big phases. And periodization takes place and brings order, right? It brings order to, to something. And also many theories of development, for instance, there are many theories in psychology about a human life. And a human life is also has phases. You start usually as a baby, right? Most people do so. And then they become an infant, and then a child, and then an, an, uh, whatever, and then an adult, and then an, a senior, or whatever. And there are theories about that in psychology who try to make that more systematic. That is what I said first was our everyday way of uh, doing a periodization. And in, uh, in developmental psychology, people do that much more systematic, giving clear criteria for the different phases and so on and so forth. So again, you get my main story. The sciences do something which is similar to what we do in everyday life, but they do it more systematically, and that's what I'm arguing for. Okay. Now, for instance, oh, here are more examples. I forgot. The geological time scale is extremely important for geology. Of course, you have these cat catastrophes in between world history, ancient Egypt history, uh, lifespan theories, but also in economy you have certain um, periodizations. Uh, now, another thing of a description is historical descriptions, how the historical sciences, I call it, how the historical uh, disciplines describe. Typically, historical descriptions are um, narratives, they're stories, right? They're, they tell a story. They tell, if you tell the story of Taiwan, if you have a historical description of Taiwan, you tell a story of Taiwan, you may start in 1945, for instance, and then the story would happen, right? This happened and that happened and this guy died and this one not, and so on and so forth, and you have to tell this story. The histori these stories, historical descriptions, have the same structure as the philosophers of history have shown, convincingly, than our everyday stories. So if someone would ask me, Paul, why are you here in Taiwan, right, then I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story that I met someone in Beijing whom I had met before, which is JJ, and then we talked about it, and then JJ said, would you like to come, and then I asked my wife whether she allows me to come. Oh, no, I didn't do that. No, and so on and so forth. 
you know, and then I tell a story. I tell the story and then I said, you know, and then I boarded a plane by Eva Air and then I flew here and I was picked up by a taxi and I arrived at the hotel and then 20 minutes later JJ picked me up and then we decided to come to the lecture hall quarter to two and then I came and that's the story. Now you understand to some degree why I'm here and I describe it and that sort of story is not in principle different from the stories historians tell. Historians do it much more systematically. For instance, I didn't have to give you a footnote. But if you look at a history book by a professional historian, there are footnotes to every sentence almost, you know, because he has to say that sentence is backed up by the sources. You just believe me, I hope. Well, I didn't lie to you. Okay. So, and here we have no, now something very interesting because something extremely new entered the scene namely new, a new type, the computer simulation of historical processes. Of course, that happens in the natural sciences. The example is uh, the, formation, um, the formation, evolution, and clustering of galaxies and quasars. That was something which a year ago was published in Nature, an extremely interesting article, computing time on a supercomputer more than a month. Incredible. But it was really history. It was really doing history by new means. The, the social historians, of course, don't do something like that, but that's something new. But again, you see, it's a different sort of story that's told that way, but certainly it's more systematic than my story telling you how I arrived in Taiwan, for instance. Okay, so far for the descriptions, you see immediately by these examples, which cover quite some different disciplines, that the degree of systematicity is very high and much higher of corresponding things we do in our everyday life. So let's continue, systematicity of explanations. Now, what I already touched in some sense is explanations by empirical generalizations and models. You can use the ideal gas law to explain a change in state once you, for instance, change the volume and then the pressure, for instance, you increase, you decrease the volume and the pressure increases and you can then quantitatively explain that in an ideal gas given the conditions under which the ideal gas law holds. So that is of course something by an empirical generalization and of course we have that in everyday life as well. We have especially and sometimes not so nicely empirical generalizations about people, right? Especially where they come from. For instance, if someone comes from Germany and has a German passport, he will have the following properties and then you use that empirical generalizations to explain certain things. Okay, I hope you're wrong but uh, in that particular case, but that's a different story. So that is something known to us. We generalize, we have sort of, we have uh, ideas about the weather, perhaps intuitive ideas and think, oh, the weather is such and such, I can explain why it's raining today again. Um, and um, these explanations are then similar in kind, but they are less systematic as we see in the following even more clear. Now, in the natural and some social sciences, we have more, something stronger, namely the explanations with recourse to theories, causal theories even, um, resulting in unification. If you have a, a, a theory that usually unifies certain laws, that's the idea, if you have, say, Schrodinger's uh, equation, quantum mechanics, that unifies certain laws, you can derive from it, and you can use it um, in the sciences uh, for explanations which are then very systematic because you're using one and the same theory for many different cases. Just Schrodinger's equation is a wonderful example because quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, has an incredible number of applications and as far as, it, as uh, one can say, it never fails apart from the measurement process which is a little tricky, but forget about the measurement process. That's a pain in the neck, okay, isn't it? Um, you have something in the social sciences, look at their explanations, that in the social sciences very often the explanations of actions uh, have recourse to the intentions and beliefs of someone. And they have, I claim, the same structure as in everyday life, but they are more systematic. So, an example. Try to explain, now first in everyday life, why did I come to Taiwan? Okay, And then you have to say, you have to know what I want, you know, my intentions. <coughs> what, what, what do I want, right? And then you have further to know what I believe that I can, how I can realize my intentions. 
So for instance, let's say, let's assume that I want to be internationally also known in Asia, right? Let's assume that for the sake of argument, that I have this intention. And then I believe, okay, I get an invitation to Taiwan. Oh, that will help me to become more, become more known in Asia. And therefore, that's the explanation why I come to Taiwan, right? You have to have intentions and beliefs. And this is what in some social sciences is also done. Uh, for instance, I have analyzed in great detail well, analyze this, the literature is there, um, the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan in 1945. And I analyzed uh, in the literature, why did Truman do that? And what you find there in the history literature is exactly that question. What was the intention of President Truman? What did he want to do? And then why did he believe that dropping the atomic bomb was the right means to achieve what he wanted to do, right? And that is exactly the same pattern as in our everyday life. These sort of explanations, they recur to uh, intentions and beliefs. The difference again being that, of course, in the social sciences and in history, people are much more systematic, right? For instance, in the reconstruction of intentions, <coughs> we usually do that in everyday life. Say someone runs out now and uh, I, I ask myself, oh, why is this person running out? And I probably say, oh, she feels sick or something. Or I have to go to the toilet or something. Or a telephone run. Or, and, and that's it, right? And I'm not very careful about it. But if you look, for instance, in the literature to reconstruct President Truman's intentions, why did he drop the atomic bomb? It turns out to be very difficult because you find different information in, in his diaries. You find different information by witnesses. And of course, then you find, have to find a balance in order to find out really what were his intentions. And that's done in a very systematic way. Whether it's true in the end is a different story, but it's more systematic at least. And that is what I try to argue. And also in historical disciplines, you have explanations by stories, narrative descriptions. And as I showed you already in the descriptions of history, the same is for the historical explanations. Historical explanations have the same structure as in everyday life but they are more systematic. Okay, let's continue here with the explanation because um, here's something nice now for those of you who read literature. There is an explanation of events in literary texts and that is done by literary theorists and they call it the poetological difference. That sounds marvelous, right? At the next party, say sometimes, you know, to your partner, you know, this is just a question of the poetological difference, and people will look at you. At least in Europe they would. And uh, perhaps it works in Asia as well. Just try it out. It's wonderful. Poetological difference. Now, the thing, the thing is very simple. If you have something happening in a literary text, say, in Hamlet from Shakespeare, Polonius gets killed by Hamlet, by Hamlet but it's an acc accidental killing. Hamlet didn't want to kill Polonius, okay? So you can ask two questions now. You can ask the question from within the text, so to speak. How did it happen that Hamlet accidentally killed Polonius? What was his mistake? What happened from inside the text, right? But there's also a different question possible because this is not a real life story, but it's a, a literary text, you know, somebody composed it, namely Shakespeare. You may ask the question, why is this accidental killing of Polonius part of that story? What was the intention of the author behind that? Why should that be a part of, of, of that, that play? I mean, there must be some sense, or there should be, or perhaps there's some sense behind it. And that's, of course, a different story. You look from outside and say, what did the author want me to learn or to, to experience? And that is the poetological difference, and that's something specifically for literary texts, very specific for that, and you use that there in literary theory. Now you may say, oh yeah, that's one of these funny things by, by literary theorists, they're crazy anyway. Um, that's not true. I give you a real life example. When my son was 12 years old, he read Harry Potter. Is Harry Potter translated into? Okay, so people read it here as well. So at that time, volume, I think volume three was out. And he was sitting together with friends at lunch. I had cooked lunch for them for a group of young guys of 12. And they were discussing Harry Potter and they were speculating 
about the content of volume four. Okay, they had read volume three, one to three, and they were speculating about volume four. What they then used was really the poetological difference. They didn't use the word believe. But what they did was the following. They thought what in volume in the volumes one, two, three is so strong in content and somehow not resolved, right? in the first three volumes, such that you have the idea the author has something in mind, you know, that leads over to the next volume. And that's exactly, that's exactly using this poetological difference. They were 12, right? Not geniuses, just normal Harry Potter readers. And that's a 12-year-old can spontaneously do. So what the sciences do, literary science here, is again, something we also do in everyday life, some of us at least, some 12 years old at least, and the literary sciences just do it much more systematically. There is, for instance, a systematic reading of literary texts by one of these authors who, who pushes that poetological difference in literary theory. So it's again the same story. The explanations that are used in that particular case in literary theory are in principle, in form, so to speak, the same as in everyday life, but they are more systematic. And that is what my story is all about. Now, what else do we have here? Now, we have something else in even wilder literary studies. You know, literary studies has gotten well, extremely wild within the last 20 years. Some people think it's absolutely ununderstandable uh, because uh, if you read that, you, you think you are crazy, and sometimes you think the literary theorists don't understand it themselves and whatnot. I'm not judging that. I'm not judging this sort of quality. I'm just telling you whether that is more systematic or less systematic than everyday life. And it is the use of theory in literary studies. So that is certainly not the same sense as in physics, right, or in biology. They have a very different sense of theory. And if you like that sense of theory or not, it's not, it's not the point. They simply use it. If you want to analyze it, you have to understand what they mean. And they mean it in the sense that they use whatever they can get, right, psychoanalysis, postcolonial studies, structuralism, feminist studies, and whatnot. They call it theory. Right? I wouldn't call it, I would not call it theory, but they do, and I'm just describing what they're doing. So they call it theory, and what they want to do is they want to deconstruct something. Right? That's very fancy, something, deconstruct something. That I tell you what it is. Various everyday notions relevant in the study of literature. What these people think is something very interesting and very skeptical at the same time. They think that our everyday notions, what an author does, when he writes a text, or what the meaning of a text is, or even what a text is, that our everyday notions, how we approach that, are possibly not adequate, or not sophisticated enough. And they want to tell us, in these, uh, these literary theories, they want to tell us, you've got to think about that. It's not that simple to say the author simply wrote the text and the text is was sitting in front of you at your desk. It's more complicated. And they are using then different sort of theories like psychoanalysis, postcolonial studies, blah, 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 all that stuff in order to show you, look, it's much more complicated. And that is what this term deconstruct means. It means this one is not a simple elementary term, an author or the meaning or a text, but it's something that has been constructed out of various elements. And what they try to do is then pull these elements apart and make us aware of what's in it and that such that we lose, they would call the naivete, you know, regarding these things. So they're doing something quite interesting whether you believe that in the end or not, it's a different story, but they're just doing something very sophisticated and they do it fairly systematically. Of course, in a very different sense again of systematically, and that is what I keep telling you all the time, systematicity is a term, so to speak, with many faces, with many, very many concretizations, different in different fields and in the different dimensions. Okay, let me continue. Aha, uh -huh. here, we have got something nice again. This is uh, what the physicists love, reductionist explanations. That is something that goes, in fact, across the board again. All disciplines, from linguistics to chemistry and physics and biology, wherever you look. Uh, and in engineering, of course, uh, engineering is totally, almost totally reductionist. You explain something by recourse to the part of the system and the laws governing their interaction. 
So everything you do, in, or almost everything you do in solid state physics, for instance, is going down to the parts and then explaining. There is some controversies about that. I'm not, I'm not saying this is, so to speak, the royal road that everyone should use all the time. There is some controversies has come up in the last 20 or 30 years. But certainly, great areas are reductionist. That is, by the way, the same we do in everyday life. If your car doesn't start in the morning, and if you know something about cars, so the men probably not, but the women, uh, then you know there are two principal reasons. Either it's the gas or it's the electricity, right? Either you have no spark or you have no gas, and therefore no explosion, right, in the, in the engine. So you start then up, up going to both ways. And that means you do not say, oh, that holistic entity, my car, doesn't work. Holistically, something went wrong. No. You go to the parts and look which part doesn't work, right? Which is a reductionist explanation. And if you, you do that as a matter of course, there's no other way. And of course, much engineering, possibly all of engineering, works the same way. And of course, much of physics, physics is an, 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 an enterprise that is extremely deeply reductionist. And the, the main thing for the reductionist, the main um, device in physics is the concept of charge. The concept of charge, gravitational charge, electrical charge, or the other charges are concepts just to get reduction to simpler properties of uh, simpler parts uh, of systems. I can go into that in the discussion if you wish. So it's very interesting, it's a very interesting topic. And what I'm saying is that all the modes of explanation have an analogs in everyday practice, but it's quite obvious if you look at them, at any of them, in the sciences they are really more systematic than what happens in our everyday practices. Okay, I'm running out of time again, so I'm going to uh, go forward a little. Now, systematicity of predictions. Now, not all sciences in the wide sense predict. That's what I said in the last lecture. And then I was criticized by one of the physics colleagues who said, look, uh, Lord Calvin said that a, it, something is only a science if it is quantitative and predictive. And that's, of course, right for physics um, and astronomy, that they are quantitative and predictive. But there are many other fields that are conventionally at least called science, and they are not predictive, right? They're not even quantitative. So the point is, first of all, the first, and my answer then was not very, was not very good that I gave two days ago, but now I came up, I think, with a better one. The first one is, if you define science, just if you reserve the term science just for those fields who are predictive and quantitative. This is an arbitrary decision because conventionally it's not the case. Conventionally even mathematics is called a science and uh, of course the social sciences and biology are called sciences. So you are just doing something else and the question is do you have an argument for that? And also be rather careful if you make these standards so strict that you say, oh, a science is only something that is quantitative and predictive, then the mathematicians may come and say, no, you must be joking. A science is only something that has proofs for its statements. Okay, and then physics is not a science any longer, right? And then you have to have an argument against the mathematicians. And then you see immediately, you know, this is, you know, this is arbitrary, what you call a science, all right? There is some, so I stick with the normal usage of science and even broaden it to the German term Wissenschaft, including humanities and social sciences. That's my first step. The second step of the argument is don't stick to questions about the definition what a science is. And the reason is because no one is really interested. That's a question what word we use, and that cannot be interesting. But what is at stake is really something completely different, namely the quality of knowledge. That's the point. And when physicists say, you know, it's something is only a science if it is quantitative and makes predictions, what they mean is something, namely, that by having this property, you have a very high quality of science. You can test it rigorously. You can use it in a particular way. And they say, look, other fields of uh, knowledge don't have this quality, and therefore they are inferior to science right to that but it's in, in fact it's a debate about qualities right about the quality of knowledge that's the point of discussion and it's not worth it you know going and, and asking whether it should be called a science or not that's not the issue the real issue is the quality of, of uh, knowledge and there the point is it is just not true that 
there is no rigorous, for instance, uh, test for non-quantitative non knowledge or uh, even for knowledge that is not predictive. If you look at evolutionary theory, which is basically a theory that is non-quantitative, and it is a theory that is basically, it's not quite true, non-predictive, but it has been rigorously tested, and there is no doubt that this theory is very, very, very good. And I think the biologists can be as proud as evolutionary theory as the physicists can be proud of quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's the issue. It's the quality of knowledge. And now comes a third argument. That's a quite possibly unfair one. It's a, an argument by a philosopher against the physicist. If you claim that something is only a science, if it is quantitative and predictive, then this is not a scientific claim. This is your personal opinion. Why is it not a scientific claim? Because this claim is not quantitative or predictive, right? <laughs> if it's right, if that claim is right, it's not quantitative, it's a qualitative claim, and you can't predict anything from it, right? So you're just uttering a personal opinion, right? So I'm not interested in it. So, you know, it's not consistent, it's not self-consistent. When I give you my claims, right, about systematicity, then I'm completely self-consistent because my presentation is very systematic, right? <laughs> so if you look what I'm doing, I'm doing philosophy in a very systematic way, so I'm very self-consistent. And the claim that everything is only something is a science, if it is quantitative and predictive, is then a non-scientific claim, and I don't know whether you want to have that that way, then you can also tell me that you prefer fish for meat. That's the same then, you know, it's your taste. And that's not very interesting. So be careful then with the arguments, because you're losing the argument. Okay, that was, you know, I woke up two days ago, four in the morning, and thought about my bad answer, and I came up with that one. I sat to the computer, wrote it down. Okay, so let's go on here with the predictions, but I'm, again, using up too much time. Nine, and I have 40, no, 93 transparencies, I'm only at number nine. Okay, now predictions. There are many different types of predictions. Uh, for instance, predictions by direct recourse to deterministic or pr probabilistic regularities of data, and there are many examples, of course, astronomy, for instance, already in the 6th century, sorry, before Christ, uh, Sarah's period uh, with 223 lo lunar months, you could very well predict uh, eclipses, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. Um, in economics, for instance, the so-called pig cycle, by which you can predict the price for pig meat, it's much more complicated than the standard story. I went into the literature from the 1930s. It's a very complicated thing, the pick cycle. It's also used in other areas of economics. It's just a, a sinus curve, basically speaking. Uh, I'm not going to explain it. Then there are other things, the predictions based on correlations with other data sets. You know, here you, you simply take something and make an, basically an extrapolation, right? And there's another way, namely the predictions based on correlations with other data sets. I take a, an example from eco uh, economics, again from the last century, William Stanley Jevons' sunspot theory of the business cycle. He said the business cycle is correlate, correlated with the sunspot cycle, right? So we have a business cycle of 11 years. And if we think about that today, we'd say, uh, scratch our head, and that, that's, that's, that must be an accident, right? It is not. Why not? That was the end of the 19th century. These were mainly farmers, right? Farming is dependent on weather. Weather is dependent on sunspot activity. So it's not a pure coincidence. But that's an example for that. It's a prediction um, uh, correlation with other data sets. So I predict on the prediction, I, I predict some data on uh, the basis of other data sets, I mean the sunspot cycle, in that particular case. Also, in today's economics, if you look at today's ways uh, of uh, economic forecasting, you see leading indicators are the main thing. Um, that, that has been invented in the 1930s. Uh, leading indicators, it's, it's a very simple thing, basically. If you look, incoming orders for products are, of course, predictive for the production of goods because the production of a firm depends on the incoming orders, and therefore if you know the amount of incoming orders, then you can, for instance, predict the, the economic activity later. It just depends how long it takes to, to uh, get the product done. But that's, that's the simple case of uh, production of, of forecasting by leading indicators. 
And uh, if you have all the forecasts uh, for the economies all over the world, they are done mostly by leading indicators and other sophisticated statistical stuff. There are volumes um, in which all that stuff can be read. Um, then we have predictions based on theories, which is, of course, dependent on the quality of the theories that you have. And there, of course, the physicists are very good and the uh, astronomers. The calculation of eclipses using Newtonian mechanics, you can calculate the next 5,000 eclipses with great, great precision, uh, up to a second and a half a second. You use Newtonian mechanics wonderfully. It's a, a triumph, of course, of Newtonian mechanics. Or use that other exa example, the famous example, the discovery of Neptune, was also done on the basis of Newtonian theory. You could say there is another planet. And, of course, the bending of light due to gravitation famous prediction by Albert Einstein and then empirically verified 1919 by Eddington, the famous expedition of the Sun uh, Eclipse. Okay, here are more uh, interesting cases, prediction based on models. That's the thing that's most important nowadays if you look at all of science. And I give you just one example, the weather forecast models. You are dependent on it, all the weather forecasts you get, uh, at least in television and so on, are based on weather forecast models and they work the following, uh, in the following way. There are something like 10 different, in the word, global models. The, they decompose the atmosphere into 31 vertically ordered layers. So you have these layers, 31, and each containing 163, 862 grid points, namely in the following sense, in the following way. You start with triangles and make the triangles smaller and smaller, until you have a mesh size, that's this one here, that small one here, of 60 kilometers. And then you've covered all the Earth, and then you have 30 layers, 31 layers above, and that means you have then these grid points times 31 is the number of points altogether. Total number of points more than 5 million, and then the variables at each point connected by a set of dynamic equations is 5, so you've got something like 25 million variables. And then by the dynamic equation, you have, once you've got the initial conditions, you can calculate how the thing develops. Well, the initial conditions, you can't measure all of them, so you have to calculate them first. So three hours, your computers run just to calculate the initial conditions. And once you have them, then you run the model. And then uh, you get the forecast, weather forecast for eight hours, three days, and seven days. And that takes the uh, calculation time of about six or eight hours, depending on the model. And that's how predictions are done. Now, you see just handling 25 million, 25 million variables is, uh, I mean, for today's computers, no problem, but it's much more systematic than our predictions in our everyday life, right? When uh, Zhu, no, I don't know uh, what, the, what the names uh, in, in, uh, in your language are, say Jane and John, when they meet and they fall in love and then you say, oh, I don't think their marriage will hold, you know, you know, for this and that reason. And we do make these predictions about our friends, our sisters and brothers and make predictions. Yeah, you shouldn't do that, you know, that won't work. It, it, it's very nice and, and possibly useful, but certainly less systematic than something like that, right? I think there is no doubt. Okay? The local models, by the way, just for your information, when you want to know the weather today uh, or tomorrow, rather, in Taipei, you have a local model, typically a local model with a minimal mesh size of 7 kilometers. You have more variables than with a local model that is embedded in the global model. So you take as boundary conditions of the local model, the global model that you take, and then in the, you calculate more more. Um, accurately with a mesh size of seven kilometers and then you can say that in the north of uh, Taipei it will rain and in the south at the same time it won't rain, perhaps. Okay. Now another thing is the predictions by Delphi methods. That's also something we use in everyday life. Uh, it means you ask people, right? Basically, you ask people, what's going to, what is going to happen? In the Delphi models, it's the following, you ask experts individually about their predictions about certain things, and then you feed the results back to them until individual answers converge. If they converge, they're not always converge. That is the method if you want to know, for instance, how will military technology develop over the next 30 years, which is a question politicians are interested and must be interested. How can they predict that? That's what they do. They use a Delphi method. They ask the experts, 
and then you get the individual things, and then you feed it back. You tell this expert, look, the other expert said something different from you for the following reason. And then he thinks again, and so on, and used even several steps. That's called a Delphi method. It has been invented by three philosophers, by the way. Nick Rescher is one of them at the Rand Corporation in uh, the United States in the early 50s. Three philosophers developed these uh, Delphi methods by Rand Corporation, I mean, a really uh, intelligent um, uh, firm. Okay, so this is, of course, similar, similar to what we do. Uh, I have a certain opinion about uh, Jane's and John's relationship, and you say, oh, no, 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 I believe they will be divorced in two years, and I say, but look, their families, they hold together, blah, blah, and they, oh, yes, you're right, this is an important factor, and then we converge that they will be divorced only in five years and not in two years, for instance. Uh, so, this is really something we do in everyday life as well, and it's done more systematically in the sciences, and that's what my continuing story is. Now, the systematicity in the defense of knowledge claims, this is, in a sense, the most important of these dimensions, because this is also from the discussion uh, in, the, in the first talk, this is what is an essential part here of systematicity. If you don't want to call it systematicity, then you don't call it systematicity. That's an important part. The sciences are extremely systematic in the defense of knowledge claims, right? You must not just say something, but you have to defend why you say something, and you must give an argument. And, of course, um, that is why the sciences take into account the fallibility of knowledge claims. You know, knowledge claims can be false. You state, this is so, it's so, and it's false. And we human beings make these mistakes and, and fall into errors all the time. And the sciences take systematically that fallibility of knowledge claims into account. More than anything else, they do that very, very, very carefully. It's a systematic attempt at error elimination. And there are, again, very different uh, strategies how to do that. Of course, in the formal sciences, it's quite clear. You have to pro a proof. In mathematics, something is only accepted as either an axiom or a definition or a convention, or it's a theorem, and a theorem is only a theorem once you have a proof. Otherwise, it's just an assumption or a dream or it's a hypothesis or so, and people may be interested, but it's not a part of mathematics, really. Uh, so in the formal sciences, they are very rigorous. They only accept statements uh, if, they, if they can be backed up by a proof. In the non-formal sciences, in the empirical sciences, Empirical data play a preeminent role, of course. But how they play this role at error elimination is extremely dependent uh, on, um, on the domain you are dealing with. So in some areas, of course, it's the experiment. In some other areas, in literary areas, criticism of sources, etc., etc. Especially important is, of course, this critical um, use of empirical data once you use theories, because theories are in principle speculative. So uh, physicists are all speculators, because the theories are speculative, and they can always be wrong, and therefore you have to be so extremely careful in testing them, so, uh, because otherwise you would be wrong all the time, and in that way you are only wrong part of the time. Um, okay? And in the historical disciplines, you have, uh, for instance, systematic procedures with respect to sources. If you have a certain document that tells you something about the past, you don't simply believe that document in, in uh, historical sciences, but you make a critical evaluation, say, is that possible, is that plausible, or may that be a hoax, or may it be a lie, or may it have a political background, and whatnot. So there are many ways how the empirical sciences now, including history, uh, deal with that problem with the uh, knowledge claims, the fallibility of knowledge, and science is systematically trying to avoid error, and they do it in different ways. And again, here's something why quantification is so important. Why quantification, when successful, is such a wonderful thing, and therefore it's used everywhere, not only in physics, but used everywhere, because if you have a quantified statement, you can much more severely test it. Right? If someone says, Today, it's moderate temperature outside. You don't really know when this is wrong. Well, you know, of course, it's minus 30. It's certainly wrong. But if someone says it's 15.9 degrees centigrade, it's very clear when this person is wrong, right? It's very clear. With qualitative statements, it's not that clear. So it's quite obvious why quantification is also in this respect something wonderful and therefore highly valued wherever it's possible and wherever it makes sense, 
when it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't become better by doing it uh, uh, nevertheless. Okay. Critical discourse is something which is, of course, an essential part of all the sciences, and that means now a social dimension of science. This concerns the social organization of science and not directly scientific knowledge. And you are at the moment, or at least in about 15 minutes, um, a witness to that. There are countless social institutions that systematically foster critical discourse in science. If you have an invited talk, there will be a discussion period later. You have conferences, papers are refereed, books are refereed, there are reviews of books, and so on and so forth. And I'm now concentrating on the social organization. This is part how science as a social enterprise is organized. So we will have, of course, as a matter of course, after this talk, a critical discussion. I mean, I, I hate it, it at certain festivities when talks by scientists are given and then no discussion afterwards. I, I find it perverse. And I insisted on my 60th birthday when there were talks were given, I insisted on a discussion afterwards because I find it ridiculous. Because someone turns 60 not to discuss it is ridiculous to me. Okay. And um, many of these institutional forms are, of course, already practiced in science education. And that's, of course, very important that they are already practiced in science education because they are not only important for science, but, of course, they are also very important if you happen to live in a democracy, because then the citizens must be able to critically discuss the matters that are of importance to them. And there is a very important part of science education uh, to be played, and that has been in the last 50 years um, stressed many times, also in the World Conference on Science in 99, in which I took part. It was a very important by everybody important uh, importantly stressed part science education should be critical and it should enable people all over the world because it enables them to take part in the political process and that's very important for the development uh, of our world okay there's something else epistemic connectedness i mean i'm again i'm shamelessly uh, overusing my time do i have uh, 10 more minutes jj is it possible yes. oh, more or less okay i apologize um, epistemic connectedness cannot, like systematically, be very precise at an abstract level. It means, on the abstract level, all sorts of logical and epistemic connect, uh, relations, logical dependency, confirmation, generalization, or citation even. And you say, so what? And indeed, this is not very enlightening at this point, and which relations are meant depends on the context. But I'm telling you now why I'm using this epistemic connectedness. The purpose is to distinguish, for instance, product development from applied research. I talked about that two days ago. You know, there is, a, there is not a sharp dividing line, but there is a division between them. And if you ask what is the difference, for instance, regarding automobile engines or chocolate uh, than chocolate science, the difference is this. If you look at what is done at engineering departments concerning automobile engines, they are typically trying on a very general level, say, to increase the fuel efficiency. If you look what happens at Toyota or Mercedes-Benz, when they try to increase fuel efficiency, they do it on a much more restricted level. For instance, they have a certain engine they have used and built for 10 years, and then for the next series, they are trying to improve it. So very punctually, they improve of that particular engine. And that means it has little epistemic connectedness to other things. Whereas a general strat uh, strategy to improve fuel effectiveness can be applied to many, many, many different cases. Right? It's more strongly epistemically connected. And in that case, that makes then the difference between the product development and the engineering stuff. So in order to make the difference between product development and engineering science, this, con this um, dimension of epistemic connectedness is very useful. You can also use it in the, in the uh, social sciences if you try to dis uh, distinguish political journalism from contemporary history. If you read, for instance, in a good newspaper, a report of the latest development in Iran, say, the last two months, then by content you cannot distinguish that, or possibly not distinguish that, from a good journalist or in a journal for contemporary history. The difference is the number of footnotes, right, roughly speaking. That's the difference. And what do the footnotes do? The footnotes are, of course, only in this one, in the scientific paper, 
and they connect to different things, different countries, different theories, different periods, and so on. And that, therefore, this one here has much more epistemic connections than the, than the journalist's article, and that makes the difference between the one. This one is then journalism, and this one is science in that wide sense. Okay? The scientific domain has the higher degree of epistemic connectedness than the applied domain. That's the idea. Uh, if you want to distinguish that, and that is, of course, for systematic reasons, important in my context. Then we have the idea of completeness in the sciences. Again, this is very obvious. The strong and steady increase of knowledge is one of the principal differences between science and other kinds of knowledge. It's in no other culture that an increase of knowledge that happened within the last 400 years in that scientific uh, culture that has no much anywhere in the world at no period. And that is something extremely specific for that tradition in science. And if you want to explain that, how come? I mean, why? Why? Then the answer is it's um, an ideal of completeness is at work here. And that ideal, that's the motivation between the fact. And it's an ideal of completeness with respect to the domain in question. And it's very simple to give you examples here. I mean, an axiomatic system in mathematics has to be complete as far as it goes, of course. The periodic system of elements, of course, you want to have all of the elements, the fundamental interactions in physics, of course, uh, the question is, is it four or is it five? And you want to have all of them. You don't want to miss one, right? The classification of biological species, the division of historical process, all that must be complete. And you don't stop until it is complete. Right? So there's a very strong drive for completeness, which is a completeness is also an aspect of systematicity, right? It's an aspect, it's again, it's a very different aspect. It's not that systematization, it's completeness. That's an, an aspect of systematicity that is um, operative in the sciences. And it's not only this ideal that the sciences have, but the realization of this ideal is not pursued at random, but also systematically. So you're systematically following this systematic goal. And here, yeah, again, are the uh, examples. So for instance, you have in many, 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 many disciplines, you have a systematic search for new or improved data in archives, measurements, observations, and so on and so forth. And you can go through different disciplines and you find that everywhere. You have a systematic closing of knowledge gaps on the basis of existing knowledge. And for the chemists among you, I call science is therefore an autocatalytic process. And for the electrical engineers, I call it, it's a self-amplifying process. That's the secret of science. It's not the scientific methods. It's uh, autocatalyticity or self-amplifying. That's the trick of science, as I believe. Okay? And we have uh, the exploitation of other domains of knowledge, also systematically done. Just look how the computer invaded science within the last 60 years, it's breathtaking. Some areas you cannot recognize now since computer exists, they are completely different from what they were before there were sciences. And that's, of course, a systematic way of improving it. Uh, technology in general, if you look at high energy physics, for instance, but computers, of course, everywhere. And there's even something paradoxical, the systematic exploitation of chance. That is done in the sciences brute force approaches that just try out every possibility in pharmacology. Extremely important. You are screening 100,000 of different compounds for their biological activities. That's how new drugs are developed these days. You have explorative experimentation and you have chance discoveries during the test of hypothesis. All these are things how you systematically uh, generate knowledge. Let myself not be misunderstood. There is also a chaotic element in the generation of knowledge in science. And the very creative things are almost always chaotic. But uh, it's what I'm claiming here is only that the systematicity is higher than in our everyday knowledge. And that should be obvious from these examples. And finally, of course, the structure and representation of knowledge in the sciences is very, very systematic, much more systematic. Uh, here again, you have in the formal sciences the axiomatic representation. In the non-formal sciences, you have a variety of distinctions how you can bring order into your representation of knowledge, the structure of knowledge. You have the dis various distinctions, the general versus the special, hypothetical versus secure, empirical versus theoretical, logically dependent, and so on and so forth. Um, 
And you have very special forms of representation. That's illuminating if one runs through the sciences here. Nomenclature, graphs, maps, tables, catalogs. It's, one could lecture five hours just about different forms of representation in different fields. And scientists are extremely creative about that, about graphs and whatnot, uh, how one can uh, then represent scientific knowledge much, much better than what we do in our everyday practice of representing knowledge. And here, this is just a remark, the systematic representation increases the efficiency of knowledge reception, also, of course, of knowledge teaching, and it supports error elimination and the knowledge gap diagnosis. So what you have with that systematic representation, that's not an aim in itself, but it supports the other aspects of systematicity. So we have within science positive feedback loops or autocatalysis, uh, such that the systematicity increase. That's the trick of science, you know, increase of, of the various um, aspects of systematicities by back by positive feedback among them. And that is why this uh, steady increase of science within the last 400 years have taken place. Okay, I'm running really out of time, so I will be rather brief in the comparison of my position with other positions. Now, the heuristic thesis I'm using here is that the earlier exploitations of science from Aristotle or Descartes or Kant or who not were not just mistaken. They were not just wrong, but they were one-sided. For various reasons, they were one-sided. Uh, that's, of course, a, 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 a thesis in Hegelian spirit, and Hegel was quite right in that sort of analysis, I think. Uh, so I'm using it here. It's a, it's a heuristic thesis, uh, and we start, of course, with Aristotle, and with Aristotle, what you have there is a categorical deductive ideal of science. If you don't like these words or don't know them, don't care, Euclidean geometry. That's the model, right? And that's the model for science in Aristotle. And that is, of course, that stresses the systematicity regarding the defense of knowledge claims, because you've got to get proofs for everything, right? And regarding the structure and representation of knowledge, because you get the axiomatic representation. Okay. So we have two aspects of my systematicity stuff here, but the other aspects are more or less missing, and you have them in a very special sense. Okay. Now, Descartes is, of course, a very important person, at least for the Western tradition. He is the key witness for the idea of method as the adequate means for the explication of science, you know, the scientific method. Now, if you look at it, there are the four rules of method in the discours de la... Um, the dis discours de la... No, I forgot this. Hmm? De la méthode, yeah, oh, sure, of course, de la méthode. Okay, here they are in short form, to accept as truth only something if it is evident, then to dissolve problems into smaller problems, to think in adequate order, and to strive for completeness. That is what Descartes says about the rules of method for science. Now, these four rules are either heuristic, that's a rational heuristics, namely root, uh, rule B and C. And we wouldn't buy that necessarily, because it's not always the royal road, but that is what Descartes thinks. And the other one, they can be, of course, subsumed under my nine dimensions of systematicity. Completeness is number eight and nine, except of truth is a special form of number four. So you see, it's really a special case of my nine dimensions. And I continue, of course, the same way. Oh, okay. Usually I insert the joke here, a German philosopher has to use Kant one part of his talk, otherwise he won't be accepted anywhere, uh, at least not in Germany with the more traditional people. But it happens that I use Kant in spite of that, okay, because I don't care about these um, formalities. Kant appears to be a defender of systematicity, so many German philosophers would say, of course, it's all in Kant, right? And you can't be original in comparison to Kant. I think we can be original in comparison to Kant. Uh, now, why? Uh, Kant, for instance, says the systematic unity is what transforms common knowledge into science. So, he anticipated me, really. No, not really. No, not really. His, here, name is systematicity concerns only the structure and representation of knowledge and is understood in the restricted sense of axiomatization. So what you have in Kant is indeed a stress for systematicity, but in a very restricted sense. So what you see is I'm presenting the more general case, and that is what I've been claiming all along. Now, other people, uh, um, other uh, positions, logical empiricism and Popper, I put them together, although Popper would kill me for that, because he said he was not a logical empiricist. Their main topics was the discussion of the role of observation sentences and of inductive or deductive confirmation or falsification of hypothesis. These were their main topics. 
why, and of course scientific explanation and prediction. They discovered that, they, they discussed that in great detail, and you see immediately the main trust is systematicity regarding the defense of knowledge claims, all that is about the defense of knowledge claims, and of course explanation and prediction in that this part. So again, and, and I told you in the last lecture, Hempel called that systematic, systematic things, right? Um, so they're really doing something that I can re-describe as part of my story, but my story is more general. And there's a philosopher called, what is he called? Kuhn? Okay, he said something as well, I think uh, very little I'm only saying. Paradigm theory stresses the systematic character of the generation of scientific knowledge during the face of normal science. And there, of course, the systematicity, you work from paradigms and all that. Um, that's also to be subsumed in my more general scheme. And finally, firearming. Now, that's a very interesting case because apparently with against method and his slogan, anything goes, he's an opponent of systematicity and methodicity. And I tell you the private story behind my project. It was really firearming who provoked it. Because Feyerabend says science is nothing special, it's just a cultural project. And I said that can't be right. right? And uh, so he's an opponent, and I show it's even getting worse. Even more clearly, he says science has no common structure. So, Heuningen, you are dead. Okay? <laughs> and even more dead here, science is a collage, not a system. Okay? So, end of the talk, I go home in shame. Not really. <laughs> Sci-fi having opposes a common structure of science in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions, right? And that is not what I am claiming. I am claiming systematicity is something that is connected via family resemblance. So I am undermining Feyerabend and says, you are right, Feyerabend, but I've got something sophisticated that's more sophisticated than of what you thought, and therefore the uni unity of science in my uh, approach is constituted by a net of family resemblances among different concepts of systematicity is therefore very weak and therefore is not the subject of the criticism that Feyerabend launches. So I can live with Feyerabend, I think he's right, but he underestimated this more sophisticated thing that I produce here by um, systematicity. Here is my summary. Oh, the one should, oh yes, the one's okay. It's not on your, the one is not on your outline here. Of course, quoting Albert Einstein is always good. Right? Quoting Albert Einstein is wonderful among philosophers and physicists, Einstein, because Einstein is always right. Okay, in 1936, Einstein said the following, the whole of science is nothing but a refinement of everyday thinking. Wonderful. Now start thinking, what does refinement mean? What is a refinement? If you start thinking about refinement, it's something very interesting because on an abstract level, you cannot really say very much what a refinement is. You've got to give a context. That's the same as in systematicity or in epistemic connectedness. You cannot say very much on an abstract level what a refinement is. If you refine an optical apparatus, it's something very different from refining a source, right? Cooking. The man of you, you all cook, okay? Refining your sauce by adding cream, for instance, and simmer and uh, make it thicker and so on and so forth. That's very different from refining an optical apparatus. So what refinement means is very unclear. Now, I do have a suggestion. The whole of science is nothing but the systematization of everyday thinking. Thank you very much. <laughs>